Today there are two schools of thought concerning the causation of AIDS. One is HIV causes AIDS, and two, HIV does not cause AIDS. Where do you fall in this? In this? I, I would say I don't fit into any of these um, categories, and I would consider that in relation to the history of infectious diseases and discussions on the cause of disease, not infection, um, that these two positions that you mentioned fall way out of the traditions of, of debate on the cause of disease um, in infectious or disease in general. Um, so I would say that I, I don't fall into either of those cases uh, because um, uh, I think they are both framed in, in ways that are misleading. Um, uh, would you like? I'm, 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 would you like me to say? What, well, let me yeah. ask. What, what do you do? You find the two positions too extreme? I find the two positions to be uh, derived at from ignorance. Uh, the, the problems with both of them. I would say that those people who say that HIV doesn't cause AIDS. Um, uh, are generally people who are not qualified to talk um, on such issues. They generally come from people who are not uh, infectious diseases physicians or physicians or microbiologists for that matter. It would be people like Peter Duisburg who may be a very eminent microbiologist but has no credentials whatsoever to speak on the causation of um, disease. Um, and I, I just find it amazing that he's given the time of day that he is. And you have people like David Rasnick who's even more remote or, or people whom I personally may, you know, have some feelings for, but they have no qualifications whatsoever to have an opinion, and the fact that their opinions are given such prominence is, is in itself a question that needs to be asked. How is it that they get such coverage that they do when they really are totally unqualified? It's just like somebody off the street talking about atomic physics. Nobody would listen to them, so, you know, Peter Jew's book is out of his depth and really anything he has to say about this is not even worth anything. As far as, um, uh, well, if it were about molecular biology, that's another matter. Um, um, as far as people who say that HIV is the cause of AIDS, they too um, are um, out of touch, well, in a different kind of way. Uh, we are interested here in the cause of disease, not the cause of infection. It may be true that HIV causes HIV infection, but what causes H AIDS as the disease? is a much more complex question, and it's a complexity that was realized by uh, Pasteur himself. It's been realized uh, for more than 100 years, and uh, all I can say is that the people who are in the leadership position for AIDS research who say AIDS is caused by HIV and nothing else are out of touch with the history of their own discipline. I think Pasteur would be rolling in his grave if you listen to such nonsense. Uh, for example, um, uh, let's take hepat any other infectious disease. Um, hepatitis B causes hepatitis B infection. Uh, the disease hepatitis B must, is much more complicated because how do we explain the situation where many people get infected with hepatitis B but they don't get sick? They don't even know they've got it. All they know is they become immune to it and somebody does a blood test say, oh gee, you must have had hepatitis B and they say, well, well I didn't feel a thing. Uh, other people die from it. So that's a distinction uh, uh, that was recognized in a oh, hundred years ago and really formed the basis of a medical education, say, in the middle of last century, which has been forgotten. So there's this oversimplified thing that Dr. Fauci will say, HIV causes AIDS without the need for anything else. That's kind of ridiculous. I mean, it's completely ridiculous. What disease exists um, that can be caused by a microorganism without any other intervention. Rabies may be such a thing. I believe so. I think uh, there are some cases of people who've been infected with rabies who haven't got rabies, but I'm not even sure that that's true. So, but, but that's the rare case. Now, we are supposed to believe that HIV disease, AIDS, is like rabies. Now, there is a term called attack rate, and it, it's well known to epidemiologists, but apparently not to Dr. Fauci. I don't mean Dr. Fauci, but I, I mean people of, or Dr. Ho, or those kinds of people. Um, attack rate is a term which means the number of people, the percentage of people who have been infected who get sick. And for most infections, that number is under 1%. It is, it's very low. Some infections are higher. We don't really know what it is for HIV. It may be very high. Um, there may be just only very few people who are infected who don't get sick. They do certainly exist. Um, however, 
Um, there may be more people infected than we know from antibody tests. So that number is still unknown. Um, but it's unlikely to be like rabies. It may be a very high number, but the fact that there are people who are infected with HIV and they, they live out their lives without it. Not many of them, sadly, but they do exist. So um, you can't be simplistic. It doesn't do anybody um, any, any good to... Uh, it also, in my view, kind of indicates the the rather mediocre level of general education that the people who have taken on the leadership of AIDS have, that they can talk in such simplest, simplistic terms that HIV is the cause of AIDS. Nothing is the cause of the single cause. Well, very rarely is there a single cause of ill health. An example would be a ton of bricks, bricks falling on you. You don't need cofactors or anything else for that matter. You're dead uh, if a ton of bricks falls on you. Somebody shoots you a, a thousand rounds into you, you're gone. Uh, you don't need anything else. But those are the unusual things, mostly um, diseases, disease as opposed to infection, um, are the result of many different things uh, working together. And those, in the traditional sense, would be called the cofactors. Um, Cofactors in, in age dialogue has a different meaning, actually. Uh, so, um, anyway, that's where I stand as far as both those things. I think they are both, um, both um, uh, untenable positions, both of them, that a HIV doesn't cause AIDS, that HIV causes AIDS, both untenable positions um, um, for the reasons that I, that I mentioned. In the traditional sense, um, cofactors might, when I say, uh, in, yeah, cofactors would apply to everything other than the infectious agent that um, um, are, are determinants of disease rather than infection. Many infectious agents do not cause disease when you're infected. They can or they cannot. And those things that determine whether, for example, if you are infected with hepatitis B, um, whether you remain totally healthy and just develop an immunity as opposed to die from it, which you can certainly do. The, the determinants of life or death in that case um, are, are in, in a person who, on the one, who are both infected with, with, with hepatitis B, the determinants of the course of the disease, is, or if there is to be a disease or not, and its course, would be called cofactors. Um, in the more traditional sense, and they would include things like the genetics of the person, their immune system. Um, uh, they may even be stretched a little bit to include strains of the infecting organism. Is it more virulent or less virulent? Although we could, you know, that sort of complicates it a bit, but it would include environmental factors. Is the person an alcoholic? If it's their liver, they would be more susceptible, you know, uh, all sorts of um, issues, what genetic makeup they have. Uh, nutritional status, I don't know what. I mean, uh, usually we don't really know, but uh, sometimes we know a little bit about it. Um, so those are cofactors in the traditional sense. Um, uh, now, in the discourse that developed around HIV, which is, as I say, out of the mainstream of debate in, on the causes of disease in infections, um, the cofactors in the HIV context um, are those factors um, that um, um, make AIDS a disease. So in a sense they kind of ally, but they're those factors that make AIDS, um, or the HIV rather, that make HIV a lethal you know, uh, infection. And so, a meaning in other words that HIV alone, just simply being infected with HIV is not going to do it. You need um, other things going on in order to do it. Um, it's a little bit like the traditional thing, but it's become a very narrow thing, which in other words, it says HIV itself is harmless. Uh, it, it's only damaging in the presence of certain cofactors. So, so is it absurd to think that the cause of a compromised immune system in a gay man in New York is the same as what causes a black woman in sub-Saharan Africa to develop slim disease? Uh, no, I think it's uh, probably different. I think um, 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 the factors that predispose... Now, you're asking me about really cofactors, I believe. I think yeah. you're asking well, me about cofactors. I mean, isn't it a little close-minded for people to think that what causes a gay man in, in New York or San Francisco to get ill and what causes an African oh. woman in such an African oh, the same. sick is the exact same from right. one single virus? In the traditional view of... Um, uh, disease 
on the basis of infection, which is, as I said, a more traditional view, which says that infection, whether you become sick having become infected after infection um, depends on a variety of different things. Uh, it's perfectly, in, in that case, that makes AIDS like hepatitis, like anything else. And uh, from that point of view, um, the factors that to make a per that will tip an infection towards a serious disease are likely to be different in Africa and uh, in, amongst gay men in New York City. They're likely to be different in detail. Um, I suppose what that yeah they, they are very very likely to be different. Yes, I did observe unusual manifestations amongst my patients in New York in the years um, uh, 1978, 79, 80. And the official announcement of AIDS, as you know, was exactly 25 years ago. That means 1981. So for about three or four years, I certainly saw abnormalities such as swollen lymph glands, low white blood counts, low blood platelets, some degree of anemia among some people. Um, that could not be explained by uh, any one thing. There was definitely something. And then, of course, other bizarre things, bizarre in that context, such as thrush in the mouth, which has became a classic sign of HIV. I started to see, I did see those things, yes. Can, can you apply the cofactors theory to the initial AIDS cases and what uh, you were seeing in gay men? The cofactor theory? Just their lifestyle? Uh, I, I do, first of all, I'm just to make it clear that I have no doubt that HIV plays a role in this disease, but I believe it to be uh, the same as with polio virus or with just almost anything else. Um, that it, it's necessary but not sufficient. Um, um, I mean that would be true for any infectious disease, influenza, anything you like. Um, we don't really understand the cofactors uh, in most infections, but you, what you're asking me, uh, in those terms, I'll try and answer your question. Um, I, I would say that um, um, without knowing this to be true, but it was my suspicion that um, in the early days of this epidemic, before we understood that HIV or there was any other new virus, um, um, uh, that the lifestyle of the guys that I was seeing, and I was seeing uh, very sexually active gay men who were highly promiscuous, had multiple sexual partners who would be uh, experiencing gonorrhea <laughs> on an almost weekly basis, would have history of uh, syphilis on several occasions, hepatitis A, B and C. Got a, uh, that was commonplace and it was um, an inevitable consequence of the, um, uh, of the encouragement that gay men in that particular culture uh, had to, in other words, have sex with as many men as they could. Uh, it was almost a philosophical thing of saying, you're not a really uh, a bona fide card-carrying gay man unless you have sex with as many people as you can. Well, um, I have no views about that, you know, in a judgmental kind of sense, but certainly from a public health point of view, that's kind of a, uh, a prescription for disaster because as we did see the rates of syphilis, gonorrhea, hepatitis, um, 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 herpes, I don't know, all of these things sort. And um, it's there that I think the interaction of all these different, um, in other words, when AIDS, as we have said, started to first occur, it occurred in these men who were not healthy. They were not healthy for reasons that were obvious to everyone who cared to look at it. They were not healthy in the sense that if you have experienced five episodes of syphilis or four and you've had hepatitis A, B and C and you've had uh, gonorrhea, God knows how many times and uh, um, uh, herpes and, and gentle herpes. If there's a barrage of all these things, I think it's reasonable to say, is there an overall impact on one's health, particularly on one's immune system? Now, you need to be a little bit more Specific. That's a very vague thing to say, but it, it, it's just a possibility that you cannot turn your back on and say, how can you live um, being perpetually treated for, let alone all the treatments and things, who knows? Um, so there, there was a reasonable assumption on my part that these men were compromised generally because of the um, exposure to the multiple infections that were right. For example, I worked for the city health department and I knew that in the bathhouses, um, I was speaking about the late 1970s, the rate we did uh, swabs 
for gonorrhea and that the rate of anal gonorrhea in, in the bathhouses in New York uh, was something like 10% at one point. In other words, a 1 in 10 chance that you would encounter gonorrhea by having anal contact with a person in a bathhouse. Now, that's, that's not trivial, that's really kind of a big deal, uh, let alone syphilis and things like that. It really was a cesspool, if you like, of infection. Trouble is, when you say things like this, people think you're being judgmental of a gay lifestyle, and that's sadly what happened to the hero with the gay leadership of the gay community. The saddest thing, I was dumped on for saying these things. I wrote an article for one of the gay newspapers saying promiscuity is bad for your health, and people like Richard Berkowitz, Michael Callan, who were my people, um, were dumped on as being judgmental, being homophobic, I don't know what, I mean, ridiculous stuff. Uh, and I think that didn't help because um, the leadership of the, that took over in the gay community that dealt with this health crisis was the same leadership, I believe, I'm not an expert on this, but the same leadership that encouraged gay men to have sex in a, you know, in, in a, with everybody. So it's, uh, if, if that lifestyle had anything to do with this new disease, it would have been exceedingly hard for the leadership who took on the response to HIV to say, look, the things we were telling people to do have brought this upon us in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, they tried to deny it and, and sort of focused on a single virus. And if you do that, you can say, just getting infected, I remember articles at the time, is, is, is an issue of bad luck. It could happen to your aunt. But that's sort of stupid too. Even if viruses cause disease, uh, it's the behavior of people that spreads viruses. So you can't get away from it, whatever. But they did, they tried very hard. If you look at the literature, that was put out to gay men at the time. Uh, it was uh, def in defense of promiscuity, you know, you know it, 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 was, um, um, it was very hard to get out a message um, to curb, you know, set along with one partner. You know, there's a health emergency out there and uh, it's not a judgment, you know. If life, everything were fine, you go around having a ball. But, uh, you know, there's a, it's a minefield out there, and so that's all. It's not being, but unfortunately, um, there was a, um, the gay leadership did everything they could to suppress this um, particular message. So, it's so a long-winded answer to your question uh, was were the things going on. Yes, there were, I believe there were the things that you might call cofactors, and I'm saying these things had to do with sexually transmitted infections, which in turn had to do with a particular lifestyle. Some of the infections that were being passed back and forth were not the traditional, were in addition to the traditional syphilis and gonorrhea, there were things like cytomegalovirus, which uh, the carriage of cytomegalovirus in the semen of gay men um, in the late 1980s, it was something like 90 or 80 percent. Um, uh, it was higher than any other population. Everybody has cytomegalovirus, but we don't actively shed it all the time. From time to time we do. It's, it's a ubiquitous common thing that doesn't cause any health hazards. But acute CMV can cause immunological things, uh, problems. It can change the CD4, CD8 ratios. Um, it can suppress, it's immunosuppressive. There's, if you look at the literature, it's not immunosuppressive to the point that it gives you AIDS, but acute CMV infection is associated with a depression of the immune system, as many virus infections are. And that actually is probably, look at from a Darwinian point of view, is that um, virus infections have evolved some kind of mechanism to dampen the immune response, this is many viral infections, so that the virus infections can persist for longer and the virus can therefore continue to spread and infect more people. It's to the virus's advantage to do this. And uh, this is true for s acute CMV, it's certainly true for Epstein-Barr virus infections, which we all have, which was also being uh, spread the whole time. So those are two infections that have immunology, none bad enough to cause you know, uh, uh, severe immunosuppression, but certainly known to cause some degree of immune compromise, uh, including, because in AIDS, it's, one should speak about immune dysregulation rather than suppression. Some things are suppressed, other things are actually increased in, in AIDS. Uh, so it's immune dysregulation, and CMV and EBV both do this. If you take syphilis, syphilis is associated with something called immune complex formation, and that, in turn, there are mechanisms by which some degree of immune impairment can, can, re, can result from that, but not again to the point of causing PC or anything like this. So, but if you add 
this together, um, um, uh, there was a, a realistic, traditional, orthodox, scientific basis to say that repeated and reinfection with CMV is proven to occur. Sometimes, you know, you're immune, you can't, but with CMV, you can be reinfected. And um, uh, uh, so that re repeated reinfections with CMV may be associated with the immunological changes that have been documented with acute CMV infection. Reactivated EBV infections were common in gay men at that time. I did this work and published it, and nobody paid any attention until Dr. Fauci himself published in, I believe, the New England Journal that, that EBV, or that B cell, which makes antibodies, uh, um, uh, B cell activity was enhanced, and I think they attributed to EBV, uh, but there's no doubt that EBV reactivation is we all have EBV and it reactivates from time to time and it doesn't kill us. But uh, in the case of gay men during those years, EBV reactivation was the rule rather than the exception. It was like almost all the time. And um, so one can postulate that the Im immunological consequences of those um, also contributed to some suppression of uh, some dysregulation of the immune system. In this case, some of it is an increased activity of B cells. That's not suppression, it's enhancement. And EBV itself is known to do that, so Epstein Barr virus. And um, so, um, um, all the, in fact, the little observations, I uh, say little, uh, that have not been taken up by the mainstream, that are terribly interesting. And, uh, uh, and EBV reactivation is one. You know, the MAC study, the cohorts that's been as totally as respectable as you can get, they came up with the fact that, because they followed gay men you know, longitudinally, and, uh, and they could determine times of seroconversion towards HIV. And they noted that in numbers of these men, there was an EBV reactivation preceding HIV conversion. Now, why isn't that information more widely? It's old. It's in the literature. It's been there for a long time. It just doesn't suit the current paradigm because, sadly, the people in charge of the HIV industry are not very well educated. Uh, I don't mind saying this. I mean, I taught them. I would say that they are of an age where they were my students. I know that some of them actually were because I've been at meetings with somebody, one of the leaders, I won't say who, <coughs> came to me after and said he was in my microbiology class at Mount Sinai. <laughs> Uh, when I was teaching microbiology. So I'm 73, so, you know, uh, and I know, you know, just in terms of these people had a big hole in their education because um, the curriculum, when I was teaching in 1969 uh, here in New York, the time of, you know, big political, the Vietnam War, Kent State, murders, the Black Panther, what kind of stuff, closing schools, relevance, you know, these poor guys had a, um, suffered from a destruction of, of, of a traditional curriculum, which maybe needed revamping, it's true, but they didn't get a decent education, um, um, or at least uh, um, uh, they didn't get a, um, it's recovered somewhat since, but um, um, that's another issue one can go to, is to ask about the credentials of people who have taken on the AIDS epidemic. They are so different, in other words, the, the, the younger people who are in charge of things are, are so much of an inferior stature compared to the people who brought me up. I think of guys like René Dubot. I mean, they're really giants of, uh, you know, comprehensive uh, microbiology, trying to see things in a context, to look at the patient as a whole, not just simply say, it's, it's a virus, stupid, nothing else. I mean, how stupid can you get? David Ho is stupid uh, to say it's a virus, stupid. That is the most stupid thing you can say. I mean, and it's so out of sync with, 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 with medical history. I mean, 50 years ago, if he said a thing like this, he would have been a laughing stock. And it just says something about our times. That he can come up with this, and, uh, and his publicist can publish it or something, and the whole world can applaud. And he can be on a PBS program as a big hero. And he's really a poorly educated sap, excuse me. Um, but. Well, let me just switch gears quickly to that, and I want to go back because that was a long answer. But let's let's talk. About I'm sorry, this moves me somewhat. So you know. Let's talk about scientists today. I mean, most people don't realize that when David Ho became Man of the Year in 1996 for the Time magazine cover, it was along with a PR campaign that he had prepared. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what, what's 
can you talk about science in the old days and how it was well, the yes. spread of knowledge and yeah. truth? Well, I, you know, science has never been to, to say that things have ever been totally pure and disinterested as sort of being totally naive. So it's a question of more or less. But at the, in the time when I did science, as it were, and started doing it in the late 1950s and 1960s, there still was a, a kind of tradition that um, you, you went into a scientific career, that there was no money to be made in it, but you chose the pursuit of interest. You were turned on, the whole thing was exciting, you know, you wanted to go to Mars. It was really, you know, it was a turn on to just sort of work in the lab and, and there was no, nothing to be gained. You weren't after fame and fortune. Well, it's not 100% true. Of course, there were people who did this and there was competition and stuff like this, but it wasn't like it is today. Um, and the idea that you would um, go into science just because it turned you on uh, was really respectable. Today, they'd laugh at you. If, if you <laughs> one would, it would be a kind of ridiculous thing uh, to do. Uh, so um, some of us went into research labs that were government, like I did, I worked for government research lab in, in the United Kingdom, um, equivalent to the NIH, the Medical Research Council, the same thing. Um, in fact, as far as I know, the NIH was modeled on, on, on that. Um, um, so I worked for them. Um, the pay was pretty ridiculous. We weren't allowed to take money from anybody else. Some of our colleagues went to work for industry, and I can assure you that that was a substandard thing to do. We thought, oh God, uh, he just wants money, you know. It was an inferior thing to do. It was, you know, in a sort of class situation, as it were. The people who went into industry were kind of looked down on somewhat uh, as being people who put their personal interests ahead of what, in a, you know, science. And that meant that science was something of a gentleman's pursuit. People who were richer, so if you look at the traditions of the Darwins, the Huxleys, these were all well-heeled people, basically speaking, who had the leisure, the money, you know, to collect butterflies, do things. But it was a gentleman's pursuit and, um, uh, and, and wrong in that sense because, you know, priests, uh, there was a supposition that you had the means to do this. Um, what's happened today, and, I'm, and that's not good, I'm not saying that's a good kind of thing, but there's been a change um, between backing the pursuit of pure science for its own sake towards pursuing science that can yield a profit um, uh, to applied science. Uh, and, and then governments, for example, the British government once backed people, not, not projects. They backed Watson and Crick, for example, because they thought they were bright and they came up with the structure of DNA. Uh, Later on, I worked for the same medical research council that employed Crick. Later on, in the 1970s, we started getting messages saying, well, if you can think of projects that can have economic consequences, you should try and you know, do that. Uh, consequences that can profit us, we can get a patent on, you know, stuff like this. Uh, Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin, penicillin didn't make a penny. <laughs> I mean, he didn't patent it, you know. So, so it was then, um, what shifted was a um, uh, science as a means to an economic end. And, um, and then science became a very profitable, slowly became a very, very profitable business, uh, potentially a very profitable business, and you got the, 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 the influence of industry on the universities. Industry, what? I just have to go back to the sexually transmitted diseases, but no. I want to ask you one more question about Fleming, Alexander Fleming? Yes. Why did he not patent penicillin? Because the, the eye was not on the money then. These were people who were interested in the, the truth in big words, you know. They, they, were, they, they were turned on by the notion of discovery and they got a they got a kick out. I mean, there was something that drove them. I've experienced that myself, you know, you know, just sitting in front of a radiation counter and, and just seeing the numbers sort of the wheels turning around, you know, at a particular, realizing that this is hey, it's a new species of RNA that we found. It's, it really turned you on and it, it, that was reward in itself. Um, well, I can't say with Alexander Fleming's case because I'm, I have no doubt that he understood the medical implications of what, but uh, not just he, but the whole system. He worked at St. Mary's Hospital in London. Um, and, but the whole system was not geared towards hey, what can we get out of this? Um, as that happened later on, um, I think partly because of the penicillin issue, realizing how many, you know, what a fortune had been lost uh, by not doing this, so they became uh, more conscious. And the scientists were instructed often, as I was instructed, to keep my eye open 
uh, for um, patentable money-making things. Uh, and that, I think, is a, the beginning of the, um, the rot. You know, science is one of those things that maybe thrives best when you just let clever people do whatever they want to do and trust them, you know, trust that they're not going to waste your money. They may waste your money a little bit, but, you know, they're going to come up with the structure of DNA, uh, the, the Sidney Brenner, the, the, the triplet code, you know, the, the, the genetic code. Um, uh, you know, a huge interferon was discovered by my boss, uh, also worked with the MRC. Uh, you know, these things came out of just giving people space and machinery and a little salary and say, enjoy yourself. And you know, it wasn't, there wasn't an adding machine at the end saying, you know, now it's all done that way. Uh, you know, you invest what you expect to get back and you have a different type of person. And there have been other changes in science uh, uh, that have led to our rather sorry state of affairs. Uh, I, I think I can maybe just speak to one because it's a very important one, is that in the United States, um, uh, funding for universities uh, became much more difficult to get, and that the whole issue of grant writing and funding your own research became absolutely crucial in the 1970s and throughout today. So people on the faculty had to come with funds. They had to be good at getting grants, not necessarily good at things. So what I saw happen, because I was around during this time, I had to start doing it myself, write grants to the NIH, and uh, you know, let alone the fact that all the paperwork is, is enough to drive you quite crazy. So writing grants became a skill in itself. You're either a good grant writer or a bad grant, grant writer. Nothing to do with your skills as a scientist. Um, being a good grant writer involved, first of all, smelling out what was fashionable. There was no point in, in applying for a grant in a field that really turned you on, but just wasn't fundable in the current climate. So you had to choose something that maybe wasn't your passion, you know, but you know it, it was fundable. Um, the faculty that remained tended to be people, not always, you know, tended to be people who were um, good at grant writing <coughs> and good at uh, getting funds. Uh, not necessarily the, you know, the rocket scientists, but sometimes yes, you know, no, 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 there's a, that's number one. The secondly, departmental chairman, who used to be pivotal people, you know, inspirations and uh, kind of role models and things in the old days, became business managers. They were managing three, four million dollar a year departments. And um, uh, so they had to know how to get money. They had to schmooze with the foundations, you know, with philanthropists, with uh, I don't know what. And so the, the, the departmental chairman became businessmen, basically speaking, and not charismatic, no, is asking too much, but not um, um, uh, uh, um, scientific um, uh, models to follow or inspirations or wisdom or anything like that, nothing like that. Uh, so I'm not saying it was universal, but that was a sort of trend. So now we have universities that are businesses, they have, they encourage Max, I mean people who've been very prominent in this business are people who worked at Harvard, say, uh, but also had Cambridge Biotech or other private companies and made money out of this. So this is Terrible. It's absolutely terrible. It means that their work in the universities was transported to their private companies and they made profits. And they uh, would also give money to the university. So now in Britain, for example, it's, all of this is encouraged. Cambridge University encourages their people to form companies, make alliances with companies. And so we have now other interests that determine things, which is profit making, basically speaking. You've got a test. You develop a test. Now we've got to market that test. David Bro's, David Ho's brother, I believe, was marketing manager for one of those genotype tests for virus. I don't know which one it was. Uh, uh, I know that all came out. And um, um, when there was a patient who was supposed to be resistant to everything, and David Ho did all that publicity stuff, and you know you had to use this test in order to see what kind of resistance is. Well, marketing this test. You've got a test, what's the point unless you can sell it? And so there's all sorts of other forces, and so you're getting doctors to do tests when they shouldn't be necessarily doing these tests all the time. It's a kind of distraction, and they're not being used wisely. So what I'm trying to say is that with the commercial um, intermeshing, um, uh, the objectives of the scientific enterprise are no longer 
the pursuit of truth, the relief of human suffering, the, those, it, it's really the shareholders, the returns, I mean, it's, that's what it is. And um, it's suspect, in other words. So anything you see from all the people who are in the AIDS leadership, I don't know how you can believe any of them. The same thing goes for the government, because the government now is, I suppose, in a sad kind of way, it's a wholly privately owned and operated corporation, the US government. Uh, well, I mean, all of that has to do with campaign contributions. I mean, uh, the end result of the way campaign finance happens is that actually that's what is what happens. Um, I know that's putting it in an extreme kind of way, but uh, uh, and probably exaggerated because I do know that in government they're really great guys who try and circumvent and you know get around all these crazy policies like abstinence only and stuff like that. You know, um, uh, uh, they are really terrific people. They're not people whose names are out there, but I've had you know they really are great people who try to do the right thing. Um, but um, um, as long as business. Business is business, and the public interest is the public interest, and we've kind of lost the public interest. We've, the very notion of public interest is just simply not, not a viable topic for discussion. So there is just the private interest, and that's somehow morphed into the public interest. They've convinced us just in the way that they morphed uh, Osama bin Laden into Saddam Hussein, which I think was a great, great, if there were Nobel Prize winners for spin, that would do it. Uh, they, they would win. I mean, this long beard and all of this, they, they looked totally different. They turned into, they morphed him into Saddam Hussein. Um, uh, so um, in the same way, people now believe that corporate interests are equivalent to the public interest. They, somewhere there is this sort of uh, veneration of Coca-Cola and God is what, you know, brand names. Corporate interest is selfish interest. Of course it is. Of course it is. And, you know, they try and do little do philanthropic donations. Mr. Gates has a foundation. One wonders what real good it does. And um, um, ultimately what I'm saying is that private interest and public interest are different things. I think people should be free to pursue their interests. I don't have any problem with this. But there is an area that is the public interest and should be, that would be expressed by regulation, protect people from excessive abuse by producers. I think people obviously should be free to make money and uh, pursue things, and I think that's terrific. But there needs to be some kind of regulation that prevents us from just total excess, you know. If, uh, and I suppose the notion of what you consider to be a fair profit is is not an off-the-wall idea. I think people should be, obviously should be allowed to make profits, but there. Uh, <laughs> There is a concept, I don't know what a fair profit is, but there, it is a real concept, is that when you go beyond that, there's, you can talk about greed and um, erosion of you know, the public good. And um, um, so we need some, some kind of regulation to just look after the environment, look after, make sure the water's clean, and you know, things like that, and that, that people don't pollute rivers and um, whatever, you know, they, and that, uh, that drug companies don't put out things that are not being tested properly and stuff like that. Okay, let me go back because I digress a little bit. Now, if you could kind of condense this one a little bit. I'll try. <laughs> not good at it. <laughs> How can the bombardment mm. of things like gonorrhea, syphilis, cytomyoma virus, mm. Epstein-Barr virus, right. how can all that contribute to lowering your immune system, which makes you susceptible to just inherent um, bacteria that we all have, which would otherwise be harmless to us? How can it do it? Well, uh, we we our immune systems are able to keep us alive. We're continually being bombarded by microorganisms that can kill us potentially, but we don't die. We get on with life because we do have very well evolved immune systems. If these mechanisms um, are compromised in some kind of way, then we become more susceptible to being destroyed or uh, damaged by, by pathogenic organisms. So I, I think, I don't know if that's answering your question, how can the the immune system is a protective mechanism to protect us from a hostile environment, and uh, which is, it is, microbiologically speaking, it's full of killers out there. And but yet we we get on with our lives. And, uh, but if the our whole the mechanisms that protect us, if that is damaged by, and there are many things that can damage it. Um, when AIDS broke in the early 80s, you were the first person to advance the notion that gay men 
in the fast track lifestyle were getting sick because of the COVID. I don't know if I was the first one, but I certainly uh, was one of the first people. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I just certainly did, yes. When did you meet with James Curran for the first time, and how did he respond to your hypothesis? Uh, James Curran, I uh, met him at the health department here in New York City. I had worked for the health department in New York City when I was on the faculty at uh, Downstate, and before I started my practice. I suppose in James Curran's views, I was just a doctor in the community. Um, I did that. Uh, I didn't think I would be doing it for very long. I just did that for financial reasons um, um, until I got another university job. But you know, in the meantime, this thing happened. So I was slightly different to most of the other doctors. And James, uh, I spoke to James Curran as a fellow scientist. Um, um, I suppose he saw me just as a doctor, and he told me to just get on with looking after my patients and leave the science to him. And, and I found that, you know, actually, well, on the other hand, why would he know any different? He was an epidemiologist. He didn't know where I was coming from. And um, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I'm understanding enough to, under, you know, to know that. Uh, so yes, that's when I first met him, and that was his response to me, when I could have been of great help to them. Um, you know, it could have been a great help. I was, I was you know, trained, um, absolutely trained. The truth is, for other people, like Bob Gallo or Tony Fight, they knew me as a scientific person. They certainly never treated me that way. <laughs> I've, I've never, you know, I, I mean, they, they did accord me at least some kind of respect as a fellow scientist. And um, uh, because, uh, I mean, I'm in the literature, I've published scientific things enough, and you know, it's not that I'm particularly well known, but I, you know, it was sufficient. I'd worked in decent labs and, you know, with decent people and all of that, and did have, a, did have a background that was known to these people, but not to epidemiologists. So that's the answer about James Curran. And very early on in the epidemic, there were, before HIV was discovered, there were two theories. Um, one was that there was a new agent out there, and the other was a multifactorial theory, which I was, as far as I know, the only person who wrote it, published a plausible model for a multi-interaction of things that I spoke about, only using things that were known and in, in published in the literature, and then making conjectural model how it could happen without the involvement of a novel. It was only a theory. and. Um, um, so was the other thing only a theory at the moment. Uh, so there were these two, two camps. Um, and um, 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 whatever gets, as I see it, whatever, which, so there's a competition between two theories. And um, different interests latched onto different theories for different reasons. Uh, for example, the drug industry would be more interested in the single virus because that leads to a, a drug. I mean, what they're interested in sexually transmitted diseases, lifestyle, there's nothing in it for them and as far as that's concerned. So they would like that. Uh, the, the, interestingly enough, the conservative um, family values lobby likes the single virus because it says if you have sex outside marriage, you could die. Uh, if you're a gay man, die. <laughs> um, so. And at the same time, the gay leadership liked it too. So they were joining hands with their enemies, in a sense, both favoring the single virus thing because it takes the view um, away from lifestyle. It puts it on a single virus. So I think those interests, um, then there is the appeal of high tech stuff. Um, um, uh, I think people are turned on to something, you know, people working in a lab, Whereas the multifactorial involves sort of sociological ideas about lifestyle, about clean water, <laughs> about you know behavioural things, which is you know, can't get a handle on that so much. You know, if you look at people, that, for example, just illustrated. I went up to Boston early 1982. There's a thing called the Cancer Club, and I was asked to give a the multifactorial view. Max Essex, who's a buddy of Bob Gallows, gave the new virus view which in those days was HDLV3, totally off the wall. So Max Essex insisted that I went first, that he went next. So I went first and I gave this sort of philosophical thing about lifestyle and behavior and blah, blah, blah. And then he went next and he showed lab pictures of gels and bands and stuff. And at the end of it, nobody had a question for me. They all bombarded him. He was the star and I was just kind of like, you know. And so, uh, uh, 
So that's I was thinking about the appeal of the lab as opposed to a more sociological sort of uh, thing. So I, I'm just trying to answer, you know, about the conflict and um, and then um, 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 I, I think as, as time went on, this notion of a single virus, which is way out, it truly is way out. I mean, I have to tell you, rabies, I can think of but to say that this new virus, which they did, had a 100% attack rate, I'll show you about the attack rate, it was radical, it was just off the wall radical, because most infectious agents are not like that. And they were saying that HIV was like rabies, which has made it kind of unique, and there was no experience to say that. One didn't know that, um, but yet it, a little model was pushed and it sort of got traction. Then we had the influence of publicists, the fact that science writers are really completely limp by and large, you know, really completely limp. They are people who, if you take that, the fact that they are not investigative reporters any longer, they don't go out there and ask, are there people who disagree with you? Or do, are there scientists who have different opinions? Who are they? I'm going to talk to them. Uh, they, they, they want to take that together. And this, I have to say, this was the science writing around AIDS was abysmal. There was none of this sort of uh, investigative stuff. Uh, then we had the sort of cranks like Peter Duisberg on the scene. I mean, real total nuts who got traction. Uh, as I said, why should anybody listen to Peter Duisberg on? They might as just well listen to him on, 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 on how to build an atomic bomb. You know, I mean, what does he know about any of this kind of stuff? And you get people like David Razzing, I mean, they, they, you know, dealing with life and death matters and they have absolutely no qualification to do it. But why did they get so much stuff? Well, that has to also do with sexual issues, people who didn't want to think that sex did anything bad to you. Um, 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 I, 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 it certainly appealed to a whole cranky audience, and um, uh, I, you know Celia. Uh, it's beyond my comprehension how she, you know, what does Celia know? She, she's, a, I mean, you know, she, I don't know if she's a friend or not, but uh, um, she doesn't have the qualifications to make any 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 judgment and, uh, at all, and she yet she comes to conclusions. Um, um, so. So that you, I'm trying to stick to your question about the impact on science. Uh, AIDS has allowed um, the development of something that was there already. It didn't create anything, which has allowed the use of science for personal um, profit. It's allowed, strengthened that particular movement where science is increasingly less directed well, it never was completely, but less directed towards, say, the public interest, the pursuit of knowledge. Um, and more towards using um, science as a means of personal gain. So it's allowed the development of philanthropies, for example, uh, cashing in on tragedy, which I find abhorrent. You have, uh, I started an organization which is now the American Foundation for AIDS Research. I incorporated, I paid for it. I started in my office to support me. Well, now it's a sort of Hollywood monster. And um, um, I don't know what the hell they do. And uh, I can't believe that I gave them life. I mean, I can believe it. it's like, you know, having children that have gone bad. And, you know, you have to sort of, uh, you know, if it hadn't been me, somebody else would have done it. But it was me, and it happened earlier than it might have happened because I did it. And, um, well, I have nothing to do with them now. And, um, but, you know, when I read all their, when I read all their sometimes, it's, it's uh, you know, the tragedy of AIDS. It's making money. It's like you see these ads of starving kids. and give money you know, on the TV ads, and you, you think, well, how much did that cost to do that, 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 that thing? Why didn't they give that money to the starving kids? And uh, um, it's, there's something unseemly about, about utilizing tragedy and the disaster and the suffering, of, the suffering of other people to, for personal gain. And personal gain in this sense also includes becoming a public person because people get turned on by having their picture in the paper or even their name in print like poor Richard Berkowitz, I believe, is on, on the cover of Celia's book. <laughs> you know, there's a quote from him on the cover of Celia's book. And I told Richard, don't let that happen because it's going to hurt you. But I suppose he, um, I don't know what it is, but you know, the, the, the attraction of seeing your name in print is so strong that uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just, maybe that's a bad example, but um, so that's what AIDS is. I've seen pictures there was a Time magazine article about Africa with pictures of emaciated 
awful people and it said uh, more or less look at these pictures and weep blah, blah, blah. Um, well I come from Africa I mean I was born there went to medical school there my mother was a doctor in Zimbabwe Rhodesia then where I grew up and I can tell you that in 1940 I could take a camera and go around and make pictures equally as horrible as that. No HIV. And so, and just as a quick digression, but this is a very interesting one. I saw, a, and it sums up things in a way of what's happened in Africa. I saw a picture, a, a, a piece in the newspaper which said that, I think it was Swaziland. In Swaziland, life expectancy has been reduced from 39 to, I would say, 33 with the advent of HIV. Now, now there's something wrong with 39. But that wasn't the point. It was, the point there was more or less that let's give them antiviral drugs so they can die at 39. Not, not stated, but that was sort of the implication. The, all the implication was HIV is dreadful, not the fact that people die at 39. That's terrible. And, and, and yet, here it was just sort of offered up to the public and they just read this and yeah, it just shows you where we're at. And why have we done nothing for African people, just like give them clean water so they don't die? in infancy of diarrheal disease and stuff like this. All we care about is HIV AIDS. Well, question, well, there's money in it. There has to be you know, other dynamic working to lead public interests to, to the African situation to do with AIDS and ignore clean water, sanitation, malaria. I mean, things that kill people um, every bit as efficiently as people who are HIV infected may be the most important determinants of whether they live or die. So, um. You, Matilda Krim, and Michael Callan founded Alphar? I did. You found what's it. founded mean? I don't really know. What, what's founded mean? Uh, well, you were, one of the, you were one of the people that started. Alphar. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. The, the, the idea for Amphar came from a patient of mine whose name was attorney, patient, oh, I shouldn't say that, but please don't, I'm not, you know, he may, I'm not supposed to say my patient's name. And, um, um, can you start over, can you just say, uh, so, uh, right, right, the idea for, 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 for a foundation came from a patient of mine, uh, who was an attorney, and the reason he came up with that idea was that I was being a research person, uh, but in the position of having a practice and treating these people, uh, all my colleagues were academics and I immediately got in touch with people at NYU, with, at Harvard, uh, somewhere in Nebraska, and um, um, I myself went to work in the lab at NYU, all for nothing. In my office, you know, were, they were terrific guys who worked for me and they all, you know, this was an emergency, I, I gave them the science, it was Michael Callan, Richard Berkowitz, I gave them the science and, uh, well, you know, much as it, and, and, and we were really great, but I was getting into debt. I was really, I got into terrible debt because I was sending blood with FedEx to all over the place and I wasn't earning money in the morning. I was going to the lab. Um, I, you know, my money came from seeing patients, so I was getting into a dreadful problem. Matilda was a friend of mine from years back. I, uh, just by chance, bumped into her at Memorial Sloan Kettering and, um, um, having had a little difference with her over interferon issues. Um, and um, we had lunch, I told her what I was doing. She was about to leave Memorial and was looking for things. She, and then she kind of, she rallied as a friend, came round to my office, helped with money, with furniture and things, found a lawyer for me to get me out of it. Anyway, so I had the idea, uh, Dennis, my patient had this idea to start this not-for-profit to support me so I wouldn't be, personally paying for all, all of this, and that was the purpose of the, what we call the AIDS Medical Foundation. I asked a patient of mine who was a lawyer of mine, who was a lawyer, uh, and his partner who was not a lawyer, uh, to draw up the incorporation papers, and they did this, and I know that I paid for it. The reason for that is that I have a letter um, from my lawyer. Uh, I'd given him an IRS refund check to pay, it was about $1,200. I said, well, use this for whatever expenses the incorporation takes. He sent me a letter with a check saying, uh, please, I should deposit it and give him another check because he didn't want to, you know, me to endorse it up for whatever reasons, and, um, uh, which is what I did. And um, they, um, uh, anyway, in, in the fullness of time they did this. I asked Mathilde, since I was the main beneficiary of this foundation. I couldn't be, didn't think it right for me to be a, a director. I was the chief scientific officer. And so the first board I asked Mathilde, 
uh, to be on it. Uh, my lawyer who did the incorporation, my office manager was the first board of this foundation. <laughs> and uh, my office manager is the only one alive, I mean, Matilda's alive. And, um, um, uh, uh, and then Matilda gave money to it. She was the first person to give money to it um, from their own, her foundation. She had a family foundation, had, had a family, I think we gave about $100,000. And she really went to work fundraising for us. So when you say founded, finding the money is founded too. So you can say Matilda founded in the sense that without her, nothing would have happened. Uh, maybe somebody else would have shown, but her fundraising was absolutely crucial. Um, so it, that's how it happened. So who is the founder? I don't know. Um, I say I'm the founder. Without me, it wouldn't have happened anyway. Something else might have happened, but it was my it wasn't my idea even. <laughs> it was my patient's idea. So is he the founder? I don't really know, but that's the reality uh, of how it came about. That's not their official history. In their official history, I'm, I'm a group of community doctors. <laughs> I'm not, you know, Michael Callan, and uh, they mentioned me, but a group of, there was no other community, there was nobody. But um, you were the first beneficiary from... Um, I was the only beneficiary. No, I was the only, it was set up for me to get me out of debt and to pay for the research that I was doing with colleagues in, 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 in Harvard, a colleague in Omaha, uh, people at NYU, and I also had somebody in Bethesda, but we didn't pay him, he was a government uh, scientist, and, uh, uh, and there was somebody here in Staten Island. Uh, we had a little team, I put together a team to do research, and, um, uh, and they were doing it for nothing, um, other grant money, and so it was really me who was um, sort of suffering because of uh, earning time, you know, being in the lab for nothing. And um, so, you know, that started. Then there was criticism from the gay community. Why should Joe Sonnabend be the beneficiary of, you know, why should he be supported? It was all this horrible politics. And I actually agreed with it. I thought, that's fine. I thought, yeah, maybe we should fund other people too. I liked that idea. So I formed a uh, I had formed a scientific committee, so we started looking for uh, people and projects to fund, and I took a, quite an quite a interest in that. I, you know, it was pretty good. I would go out to people, look at their projects, review them. It's small, you know, we didn't have much money, so we couldn't give very much. We gave some money to Joyce Wallace, who did some money with prostitutes, did some studies with prostitutes here in New York. We did a small clinical trial, um, didn't do very much, and because uh, we didn't have much money. And then uh, uh, we, I <laughs> and Matilde, hired a publicist, or fundraiser kind of guy, and he transformed the place into such a way that I couldn't stand it. You know, I couldn't be there any longer. <coughs> Anyway, and in the meantime, it's sort of gone to Hollywood with Elizabeth. I have nothing to do. You know, it's, it's, I can't believe this is what started in my office on 12th Street, but now look at it. Uh, they don't even know I exist, but it's fine. <laughs> Why was the gay community um, outraged that you were the only beneficiary? I can't uh, understand their... Um, um, the gay community in this case was the... There were two things. One was the... Uh, um, um, the gay men's health crisis that came into being just before us. Um, and we would have been the first AIDS charity, actually, um, if it hadn't been for the fact that I, somebody from NYU, tried to steal my patients and I sued him for about $5 million and I let him off and the lawyers that were suing him on my behalf because we were going to win, um, um, maybe, you know, they would have made a settlement, but uh, they mistakenly said that I should get together with him as a guy called Virgil Hatcher, who has no reason to be secretive about his name, who's a dermatologist here, who worked for a man called Alvin Friedman Keen in the Department of Microbiology at NYU, who was a dermatologist. And I let him use my office, and it turned out that I, I was going to go to Bethesda to take up a job there, uh, uh, go back to my university life, but uh, you know, my research here was taking on, so that didn't happen. And he thought I was going to leave, and he uh, started writing letters to my patients to um, uh, offer his services. And um, uh, anyway, uh, that's totally unethical, all of that kind of stuff. And, and so I... Um, sued him. And then finally when his lawyers asked for a settlement, my lawyer, who the same lawyer who incorporated the foundation, um, um, said, well, Virgil and Joe should get together and 
I don't know what's a bad thing to have done. So we got together and Virgil more or less started to cry and said, I don't know what got into me, I'm terribly sorry. And I gave him a lecture sort of thing saying, you know, your patients trust you, you shouldn't really do this. And then I said, okay, forget it, we let you go. And my lawyers were so pissed off with me because it was a contingency case too. I hope they did get some money to this day. I don't know if they did, and I didn't even think about that. But they were so angry with me, rightly so, because uh, I, I just didn't go, you know. And um, I'd report him to the police, the county mayor. He asked me to undo all those things, which I did. You know, the police complaint I withdrew and all of that. And um, um, uh, so my lawyers didn't file the incorporation papers for the foundation because they were so pissed off with me. And if they had done it, this foundation would have been the very first AIDS not-for-profit on record. But as a result of this little <laughs> event, it's actually the second. So the gay community you asked who was opposed to me was the gay men's health crisis. And I think they were opposed to me for the reasons that I mentioned to you, because of the promiscuity, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we did the first safe sex thing and they tried to buy it from us, they couldn't distribute it, it was really bad. The other part of the gay community, I don't say the gay community, there was a newspaper called the New York Native, uh, edited by a man called Chuck Ortlip, who was just beyond comprehension. He was a strange, bizarre kind of character. I mean, uh, I suppose if you looked at some of the old copies, you'll understand precisely what I mean. I mean, uh, he championed Peter Duisburg later on, and um, my criticism of Peter Duisburg caused him to call me a racist, that I come from South Africa, so I'm trying to kill my black pa I'm just going to, you know, beyond disgust, actually. And uh, so he wrote things in his paper saying that the foundation should, um, why should they fund me? And uh, so I don't know where he was coming from. I can't answer that. He was just his newspaper and this kind of thing. But nonetheless, I did agree with it. And, um, um, and I thought it was good that we should fund other people. So did you leave Amphar or did the I, I, you have a falling out? Well, I left and as a result we had a falling out. And the reason I left was that before that I was felt I was in control of that foundation. And I think I'm a decent enough kind of guy. You know, I really belong to an older school and I really think it took me a long time to realize just how politically filthy the whole process was, you know. I even had letters from this guy in Boston, Stu Schlossman, who's our collaborator, head of tumor immunology, who warned me, said, you're going to get hurt and things like this, you know, because I was sticking to, you know, what I considered to be do the right thing, you know, and um, um, fund things of merit. I also believed that we should fund people who fell through the cracks, who had worthwhile things, whereas my scientific committee, which considered, also consisted, well, had to, you know, of orthodox, you know, kind of people, felt that we should only fund people who had a track record. In other words, give money to people who got money. A kind of crazy thought. I mean, when the NIH was giving away hundreds of millions of dollars and we had almost nothing, it was kind of stupid. So we ended up giving money to people who had money because they had a track record and nonsense. Um, 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 so, um, I, but I thought I was in control. We had Thursday afternoon meetings, I remember, and all policy things and things we should do. I thought it was my show. And then, um, one day I came into the office and I picked up, a, we by now had an office through Matilde. She did all the money things. She, she found a good deal for us in the Helmsley building, it's a nice midtown building. And um, she did without her, we would have, nothing would have happened. And um, uh, it was uh, one of the networks who had received a press release from us. And I, first of all, I was amazed that anything came from us without me knowing about it. And the press release said that uh, heterosexual AIDS is about to happen, that straight men are going to drop in droves and uh, uh, and then I said something like oh, that's bullshit where'd you get that from you know and then I went to Terry Byrne that was the publicist I hired who was in the room and I said what the hell's going on and he said oh yeah we've been working on this they never told me and it was a total fraud and scam um, it was a fundraising ploy uh, but it you know so efficient was he that it, it resulted in a time uh, life magazine cover, which said, no one is safe from AIDS, and Reader's Digest, and, you know, they know how to do these things, they put stories all over the place. And I, you know, kind of, I called Matilda and I said, what the hell are you doing? We don't have any evidence that this is happening, and um, you're going to freak out straight guys, and I'm going to have to take whatever, and, and indeed I did, I remember 
uh, a man calling me and said he was with a prostitute three months before, my daughter just drank out of the same glass as me, is she going to be all right? I mean, things like that started to happen. And then I said, the next thing you're going to do is cause violence against gay men, because the only, there were drug addicts and things, but there's a subsection of gay men that you can, you can look at and say they're gay, and just, you know, uh, just a subsection, and they would be the targets of violence. And I said, that's what you're going to, it's going to happen, and it did happen. And, uh, and I said, well, I can't, you know, I just can't be associated with, I have no control, this is a terrible thing to be doing. Um, and then I was told, then I had a falling out with her. Uh, you know, I was really pissed off, with, really, I thought it was terrible. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, years later, we had a reconciliation over community-based trials, which she helped with as well. I started something else, uh, community-based trials, the CRI, you know, that also has gone wrong. And, um, uh, but it was supposed to be a grassroots research, community-run research thing, not rely on the NIH and get away from all these sort of people, you know, you know, whom I'm sort of ashamed of because they're my fellow professionals and I think they've let the side on, but that's by the by. And so, um, uh, um, I, um, um, the, the, the uh, relationship with me and the fire sort of improved over this. And, um, and so I, and I always kept an interest in them, you know, still over the years it's gone, you know, but even those years still, you know, was my baby sort of thing, you know, despite the fact that it had gone rogue, as it were. Um, um, you know, it's kind of the way you would feel towards a child of yours who's suddenly become a, well, I would say murderer, but you know, suddenly, whatever, you can't cut off, although by now it's well past anything. But in those years, they were still close enough to the origins that I felt something, you know, try to be of help to them, despite everything. And then I had a meeting uh, with them over some other issue, and Terry Byrne, um, um, we reminisced over this, it would have been four or five years later, and he said, uh, you know, if we had to do it again, I'd do it again, because once he put out the scare, you know, the money started to flow, it really did. Um, all of a sudden, AIDS was a very fundable project, and I suppose the psychology they worked on was the fact that they thought, well, in Congress, you, essentially this is white, straight, gay, no, no white, straight, uh, I mean, heterosexual men who are the congressmen, and if they feel they can't fuck around without you know, being worried about AIDS, they're going to let the dollars out. And it worked. And, I, you know, I'm not sure that's in precisely the dynamic, but I think that's what they were going for, Mr. Average America, who does go to see hookers, who does, you know, whose life is the way it is. And if they feel they can't sort of conduct their devious life in safety, they're going to start getting money to find out. And that was what he said. He said he would do it again, although it was not based on it. And in fact, it hasn't worked out. Really, it comes to not that women don't get it, of course they do, but heterosexual men, I don't, you know, it's, it's so rare, it's not an issue. I mean, if you're a heterosexual straight guy, doesn't have sex with men, don't shoot up, not a haemophiliac, you get something, but it's not going to be AIDS. And um, um, so that's the reason I, I split with them. And um, <laughs> that's, that's an interesting story, I, I've never heard that. Well, that's the truth, it's exactly what happened. I mean, it's, it's amazing that I mean, I saw the timeline article. No one is. No oh, one is well, it was put there. And that that all stemmed from fundraising. Oh yes, it worked. Isn't that ethically wrong to scare an entire population? What do you think? This way, listen, you live in this world, you know that's exactly what they do. They scare an entire population into going to war in Iraq, for Christ's sake. This is the way they operate. They, whoever they are, you know, things are done that way, so why should you be surprised? Wow, okay. It happens every day, all the time. Did they ever ask you to stop spouting that lifestyle might have anything to do with it? I've never been officially asked to do that, no. Um, the, gay, the gay leadership um, just maligned me like mad, and uh, Michael and Richard too, um, turned people away from me. Um, yeah, I, I, they've never come face to face. And, but when we did the Safe Sex booklet, they did offer to buy it, and I suspect they would have destroyed it. When HTLV1 was supposed to be the cause of AIDS, it got a lot of publicity. Uh, this would be 82, something like this, I don't remember. Um, I was, had my research team, and I sent 60, 80 Sarah 
to a colleague at the University of Nebraska in Omaha. And he, in turn, split it into three. He sent one to Kyoto in Japan. He sent one to Cambridge in England, and he kept a third for himself. All three of these labs ran HDLV1 tests. Not a one was positive. And um, so, please, um, quite unlike the results of this guy, Max Essex, who was Bob Gallo's mate, who you know, said, oh, X percent of people have HDLV1 antibodies. Um, couldn't get it published. We couldn't get the truth published. I have a, um, the guy I worked for at, um, worked, worked with in Omaha was a guy called Pertillo, and um, he was chairman of the Department of um, Pathology and Microbiology, and he liked the multifactorial theory, and he was a, um, a co-author with me, I put him on the paper, you know, and it appeared in a book and all that. Came to a second edition, he asked me to take his name off, and he said, um, um, he thought that his lymphoma grant that came from the Cancer Institute, which he got every year, he didn't get that year, and he said it, he thought it was because of me, <laughs> his connection with me. Well, these things happen, unfortunately. And well, I'm not saying that it was true, but the fact that he could perceive it, that it could be true, you know, it just tells you how politically nasty the world is. Because he's not a paranoid guy, you know, so I don't think it's true. I mean, I hope it's not, but, you know, the fact that he could even envisage it sort of says a whole lot about the way these things work. And it's not the only time this has happened to me. And then once he sent me a copy of a letter he sent to, to Bob Gallo um, to do with John Crutzen, uh, what I told you about HDLV1, we couldn't get it published. I was editor of a journal then called AIDS Research, the first AIDS research journal. still exists. It was taken away from me by Max Essex, who went to my publisher and said, if you leave Joe Sonnabin in charge of it, it's going to fold. She believed him. And after looking after it for about three years, starting it and nursing it, it then it now still exists. And you look at the, you know, it's Bob Gallo. Every luminary in, you know, the, is, uh, is on the editorial board. Um, but I lost the journal. But I was then editor, and I published it. And Dave Patillo wrote it, and he was, uh, you know, very angry at the end, you know. And, and I, as editor, changed it. And I said, maybe we didn't find HTLV and one antibodies, unlike Dr. Essex, because our patients came from a different geography, total bullshit. I just toned it down. So I was being polite, you know, and we published it. Um, John Crutzen referred to this article in one of his Chicago, Chicago Tribune editorials. And uh, uh, Dave Patillo wrote a letter to Bob Gallo saying, I don't know how I got involved in this madness. I'm your greatest fan. <laughs> it was pathetic, actually. He was retracting the truth. This is Dave Patillo, who, you know, he wanted, then he started going to Bob Gallo's meetings and he became a fan of Bob Gallo. Then I started going to Bob Gallo's meetings myself. And then Dave Patillo died. But, you know, it's a convoluted story, and it's not the way it's out there. But my movie role, they made a movie of And the Band Plays On, and my standing up and doing what Jean-Claude Sherman said I, he didn't want me to do, or don't do it sitting down next to me, is in there. We live in a world where, where the public interest is no longer an issue that's taken seriously. There is no defender of the public interest, and that is a role for government. Now, we live in a time when, you know, government's supposed to be small and not do anything, but I kind of rather tend to agree with that. But if there ever was a role for government, um, one of them would be uh, the defense of the public interest. There is such a thing as the public interest, which cuts across gain, profit, uh, anything like this. There are, you know, in a, there are things that we all have a right to. We have a right to clean water, we have a right to road safety. I don't know, there are just certain, certain things that nobody gets a profit from, but they just simply what you might call the public interest. And certainly health, many things come into this. But un now, there was a time when and I think there still are people who are concerned with the public interest. I know people in state government who really are concerned with the public. You know, they have a hard time because their politicians are all allied to God knows what kinds of interests. But, you know, these are civil servants who do the best they can, you know, and in the federal government too. Um, um, 
But the, the notion of the public interest is, is weakened now. It really is weakened. In fact, if you spoke about it in certain circles, you'd be kind of they would laugh at you. I mean, what, you know, so to get back to your question, which I don't think I've really got away from, is that um, selective funding um, is a fact of life, is that the, I, the, the pursuit of personal gain, whether it's monetary gain, power, fame, or whatever it is, are very strong motivators, and that's what dominates everything. And that trickles down to what gets funded and what doesn't. How does it happen? Through lobbying, through campaign contributions. I don't know, there's no single conspiracy thing. It's just the complexity of human interactions and in that if you want something badly enough, and you're smart enough, you'll hire the right kind of people, and uh, you'll end up um, writing legislation like, like Mr. Enron wrote legislation on energy, <laughs> you know, something like that, you know. So, um, so yes, there is selective funding, but I don't think there's any cabal behind it. It's just human nature at work. Yes, there is, uh, and there is no government. There is no government. I mean, who do you turn to? I mean, who the hell do you turn to who you, you can trust is not on somebody's payroll? You know, who do you turn to in whistleblow? So so and so is doing something bad. Uh, this poor FBI agent who who knew what was going to happen with the World Trade Center. Where did she get? And remember, there was somebody who picked up some sort of evidence that these these people were learning flying lessons and things, and 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 she put in a report and it went nowhere. So who do you, who do you who do you who do you go to? I mean, who's de who's defending the public interest? You want to go to the Attorney General, huh? Who's supposed to be doing it? And come on. The, particularly the current one. <laughs> you, 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 what, what do you do? So, you know, how do you change? I don't know how you change this, but I don't think it's... Um, um, I don't think it's a particular group at work to do this. I mean, I just think it's human nature. We've been given a, you know, kind of a freedom, and there are no curbs. I mean, look at the environmental. I mean, you can do anything you want, basically speaking. You've got to do it the right kind of way. And so, yes, there is selective funding. If you mean uh, regulation of sciences through slavery, I think that's wrong, but I don't have an answer to... The answer I have is the one I gave you. At least the possible answer is to... is to... I put it this way, that I think the most important issue here in, in, in the US in, in a political sense, and when I say important, I mean the most potential, a lot of things just wouldn't fly, you know, that are important, but let's be real, they just wouldn't get anywhere. But one that I think might actually, if, if presented in the right kind of way, get a response, because people are pretty decent out there, basically speaking, you know, uh, is, is, is the whole issue of campaign finance reform. I think that's the one thing that um, is at the root of all the bad things. Um, and if there were a a foolproof system that you didn't have loopholes. They do all these things and they make a million loopholes. So of course, you know, uh, but if there was a real good system that allowed some space for, for the government to protect the public interest without interference and without, you know, get people of integrity to actually get the FDA to do their job properly and the FAA and all these agencies to, to, to to protect the public, basically speaking, without political interference. They're all... the CDC is not free. I mean, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if that dentist thing, or many issues that the CDC has taken off, uh, they, their funding comes from Washington, and they have to s please their political bosses. They can get calls and directions, pursue this, pursue that. We'd like everybody to get tested for HIV. It's a political decision. I don't know, you know, things like that. And they've got to deal with, if they want to be funded, they have to deal with whatever the administration or powerful Congress people, you know, because uh, they, they're not free. Uh, the British Medical Research Council is supposed to be free, but it's not free. I mean, the government, funds them, but they, it's like the BBC. The you know, BBC is supposed to be an uh, independent agency that's funded by television licence, that's how they get funded, which is run by the government. But, and they're supposed to be free you know, of government, but they're not free of government affairs. We just saw this with all the, you know, Mr Blair and the war things, and the BBC uh, said that the information was doctored, and the BBC was, you know, punished. And they had a, they fired the director general. Well, that comes. They're not free. So the same thing goes on there. You don't have, 
Okay. So that's what I think. You know, I, when I said they were under-regulated, that's what I meant. I say that the regulatory agencies, whether it's the FCC or the FDA or whatever, you know, that are supposed to keep things going in the right kind of way, are now... Um, um, the FCC is good, as far as I know. I think Colin Powell's son was director of it, and um, um, I think they did some shady things or not straight things with cable companies um, in distributing bandwidth and things. So, I mean, I say shady. I mean, you know, it's not disinterested any longer. It's open to lobbying, and so if if I you know always answer in some kind of fashion that. You know, I said just now, being destructive is not a good thing. One should try and come up with viable avenues that we can sort of rally around. And I've just got to, I may be wrong, but I think campaign finance reform is one, it doesn't attack capitalism. It doesn't say we need to be communists or anything like this. It, it sort of allows people to go out and pursue careers and uh, make the most of themselves and make money and all of this. It just introduces the concept of public interest again and you know provides for the protection of the public interest and i think people could rally you know put right it's sort of a vibe and i kind of feel it's the one thing the democratic party could could take up you know and as as a, they don't have a cause now so you know it's it's one of the sad things mr bush his approval ratings are as low as they've been and why isn't the opposition taking advantage of it it took a very long time for the real pros to get into it. I know that because I have been a professional virologist and I used to still read the professional literature, the Journal of Virology, the Journal called Virology, the Journal of General Microbiology. I mean, this is the professional literature, not science, not nature, not the Lancet, not those things. It took a very long time until, I don't know when, one would have to ask, when did the first article on HIV appear in the Journal of Virology? Um, and I think it was in the late 80s. Um, um, now it's regularly there because it's a very well-researched virus and you know, it's, it, it, there's lots of it there. Then also, when did stuff appear in the professional immunolog immunological literature, which would be immunology today, uh, immunology, just called immunology, the real professional literature, and you'll find there was almost nothing for years until the late 80s. So. It just the, the people who got. I, I'll tell you one last story, just and, and, and just only because it sums up what I'm trying to say. Um, HIV or AIDS came to public attention in 1981. Uh, the ability to detect CD4, CD8 cells um, was only discovered in 79, 70, you know, It was monoclonal antibodies. So the technology was very, very new, and um, um, the first papers and the first people to get on with this were. Infectious diseases, doctors like Michael Gottlieb, uh, uh, just people who no great distinction, uh, really absolutely of no great distinction. I mean, academic is nothing, and um, um, I'd say I'm more distinguished. Than, in the, if you're going to get on one's bibliography and the nature of one's contributions, you know, um, um, Doctor to the Stars, Fred Siegel, I don't know, uh, 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 just okay infectious diseases doctors, but not. You know, how we faced with a huge challenge, but these were not the real pros. So, um, when I started doing my own stuff um, in 1981, I knew the real pros. I mean, I, you know, from my other life, I knew them, I knew of them, I didn't know anybody particularly. Um, the ability to detect CD4 and CD8 was uh, there were two groups that discovered that. One is a guy called Stuart Schlossman. And those are the people you should talk to in a way I want to be still alive. Stuart Schlossman, who was chairman of the Department of Tumor Immunology at Harvard. He's got to be quite old now if he's still alive. He's older than me. Um, um, and another guy whose name I can't remember who worked for the Beckton Dixon Company. And so both of them independently came up with monoclonal antibodies that could identify T cell subsets. Stu's series were called OKT for OKT called. The other series was called LEU1, LEU2. Just in the way things developed, it was Stu Schlossman's series that became standard. So all the terminology of CD4, CD8 all came you know, through him, uh, through what he, his original designations, and of course it developed. So 
around about um, the end of 1981, when I was gathering material myself, I thought, well, I didn't, I wasn't beholden to anybody. I did have a link with this place in Bethesda. Um, I thought, who knows most about CD4s and CD8s? There are not many people in the world, and let's get them involved in this. And so uh, Stu Schlossman in Boston had spent a year in London at the lab that I worked. And I never really got to know him particularly well, but I had this sort of little connection with him. So I called um, my friend Bob Friedman in Bethesda, who I knew knew him, and I said, call Stu Schlossman and say that me, Joe Sommer, I'm, I'm going to call um, with a view to doing some collaborative work. And um, so I pri you know, got things ready, and then I did call him, and uh, I said something to the effect that I suppose you've got the whole world knocking at your doorstep to work on this new disease. And he said, no, you're the first person to call me, and I've been dying to get my hands on material. Now, I guess that tells you a whole lot of things. That means that it's, it's, it's the third drawer of guys who were hogging the work in the beginning. The real pros were sitting in their ivory towers. They just didn't get material. And Stu said, uh, we did things. We actually involved a whole you know, collaboration. And, um, um, and Stu said that uh, in his institution, which is the Dana Farber Cancer Centre, which is part of Harvard, um, um, that they have dermatologists there. And he said they were getting cases of Kaposi sarcoma, and he'd asked them for material. And none of them had given. They all thought they could see Nobel Prize winning, you know, in their life they're going to crack this problem. They didn't ask for the real experts to get into it. So that sort of. I think it's just a story that sort of illustrates my, you know, where I see the, the world. So if you ask people like that, I mean people who are the real pros, I think, and just to go back to your question, that they would have a consensus that infectious diseases are multifactorial. That yes, the microorganism plays a role, but the disease, the illness itself is multifactorial and that it depends on things like the strain of the bug, virus, bacteria, whatever, on the immune system, on genetics, on nutritional things, on I don't know what. I mean, there would be a whole bunch of things. René Debeau describes it very well, but I think you'd find that not these pop scientists, but you know, the sort of older people who are really pros and academically, who's, well, I hope you find those people to interview, but not the household names, but the, you know, the wiser guys, um, would, would agree that all infectious diseases are multiple. So that's, to that extent, I think there's no debate. And so they'd say, if you ask them the question about HIV, they'd say, well, why should HIV be different to anything else? And that it is an infectious disease, and whether or not you get a disease, a sickness, that the infection is translated into a clinical entity is multifactorial. I don't think there's any debate. There would be any debate at that level. I'm just repeating that I think this debate thing is a bit of an artificial construct and it sort of involves people of, you know, who history won't remember much of and whether it's Celia, Peter Duisberg, all these people, I don't know. It's, uh, and uh, equally the other side are just zealots in their own way, David Ho, you know, so, um, um, yeah, these, I mean, I mean and I, those, I, I don't care about the Peter Duisbergs, so, you know, it's different, but the ones who are in the medical sciences, I do care about because they might, my colleagues, you know, and um, I think they're letting the side down with this stupid, uh, and even poor Mr. Fauci, if he says there's no co-faction, what the fuck does he mean? Sorry, what's it, uh, saying sorry the kind of <laughs> what does he mean that there are no co-factors? Where's he coming from? There's co-factors for everything. I mean, uh, I mean, you ask him, as I said, just ask him about uh, hepatitis B. And then, then you could say, so no cofactors. So what about those people that get hepatitis B uh, and they just live normal lives? They don't even know they've got it. And why do some people die? Oh, I just wonder what he'd say. Yeah, well, you talk to him, don't you, once in a while? I do, but I, I can't see myself bringing him up on this particular issue. <laughs> and anyway, he's got a public persona, and what he might say privately is quite different to what he'd say to you. Mm -hmm. I'm sure of this. I mean, no, there's a political line that he's got to follow. In the language of AIDS, there are no cofactors because the, the, the debate has got so pedestrian that you can even talk about this. And what I'm trying to say is that if you were plugged into the traditions of infectious diseases, it would be so meaningless. Just you know, it would be just. What the fuck are they talking about? 
you know, there are consequences. You give a platform to a Peter Duisberg who says, these drugs are poison, don't take them. Here's a guy on the point of death for not taking drugs. He doesn't take them, he dies. Uh, on the other hand, there's a guy who doesn't need treatment. But our zealots, our David Hose, and all these people say, you've got to get treated with these drugs, and they're going to kill him. I mean, and so this guy listens to Peter Duisberg and has his life saved. It's, you know, it's, it's a treacherous kind of world. Since we're dealing with nuts on all sides, it's very hard. I mean, David Ho is as much a nut as Peter Duisberg. And, um, uh, and the people go along with David Ho. And Dr. Fauci, sadly, is not providing the balanced rationality that really it's his role to do. And um, um, so... Well, well, let me ask you about this. You said that AZT is incompatible with life. Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, AZT is a DNA chain terminator. And um, um, in principle, um, DNA is the very substance of life. And if you disrupt DNA synthesis, you can't live. So that's true. Uh, you cannot live. It becomes a question of dosage, uh, some selectivity on the polymerase that makes DNA. Um, and uh, AZT in the dose that was originally used killed people. There's absolutely no doubt about it. That, interestingly, is also something you could look at. Um, the first dose of AZT that was proposed was 1,200 milligrams a day, given five times a day, which from a pharmacokinetic point of view makes absolutely no sense at all. It's totally ridiculous, because AZT, when it gets into the cell, is changed and um, to the active compound. So the blood levels of AZT don't tell you anything about what's going in the cell. And I don't think they really had the technology, and they do today, of breaking open the cell. It's much more difficult than just drawing blood. So the pharmacokinetics were just totally kind of, you know, crystal balling it. And uh, Wi-Fi, people had beepers, you know, and they had to wake up in the middle of the night to take their AZT. And anyway, it became quite obvious that it was killing them. And so, um, Thank God I never gave people that dose of ACT. And then a trial was done that I believe is published in the New England Journal, New England Journal of Medicine, and you could look that up. And in that trial, they compared 1,200 milligrams a day with half that dose, 600 milligrams a day. And they found that less was better, that more people died on the 1,200 milligrams a day than on the 600 milligrams a day. And guess what their conclusion was? that people receiving 1,200 milligrams a day died of AIDS. People <laughs> receiving 600 milligrams a day were saved from that horrible death. Ask about the logic. I don't understand the logic very much. It just allowed them to not say that AZT was killing people. Now, I haven't looked at that paper for a long time, and there may be things in there where I'm not getting right, but I think Margaret Fisher may have been, but if you could have a means of doing a search and looking up that paper, it's, it's a gem. Is well, this the first paper that was No, no, no. The first paper was also another piece of shit. Um, the first paper said that 21 people receiving AZT, uh, 21 people not receiving AZT died, one person receiving AZT died. And this was too dramatic. They cut, it was in a 12-week period. They cut the trial short and gave every, everybody AZT, and then they started to die after 12 weeks. So it, it was all quite terrible. Wait, wait, wait. Can you slow back and go back? And, that was an important sentence that, that I think we should talk about. Well, the, the, the trial lasted 12 weeks, right. and then when people got the drug after 12 weeks, what started to happen? Can you they started to die. I mean, the 1,200 milligrams was is a kind of toxic dose. So they started, uh, yeah. And, and the fact that they, they lived um, also has other explanations. The ones that lived and the ones on ACT who lived and the ones who didn't get ACT died. Well, there's other explanations. I don't know what it's, I reviewed that with great depth, the, the papers I got from the FDA. And the FDA saw big problems with it. They went right ahead and proved it. They shouldn't have done that. And this is, this is all part of our deregulation. That's what I mean. Like, why did they approve it? When they saw the errors in the trial, you know, the, uh, the possible, I'll tell you what, um, one of them, I don't know what, it, it may be firstly that ACT has some short-term benefit. Yeah, that I can't deny, short-term benefit. Um, um, uh, that may have contributed something. Another thing is that if you ask why people with AIDS die, why did they die? They die because they get opportunistic infections. 
They die of pneumonia, they die of MAC, they die of toxoplasmosis, cryptococcal meningitis, tuberculosis, they die of infections. These infections are preventable, even then, mostly. They're treatable, not curable. You, know, you, don't have, you don't have to die from them. So the biggest factor in life and death in those years of age, nothing to do with ACT, it's got to do with how good the doctor you are. It's got to do with, can you pick up the pneumonia early? Do you start treatment early? Or do you wait? Um, or, you know, yeah. So I looked at all the deaths in these trials. It was a multi-center trial. Um, there were no deaths in New York. Most of the deaths were, I think, in San Diego, Miami. Um, it was patchy where the, the deaths happened. In, in Miami, uh, trial participants didn't have a doctor. Their doctor was the trial doctor. In New York, everybody on the trial, which happened at St. Luke's, my hospital, um, uh, not that I was part of it, um, everybody had a doctor. So if they got sick, their doctors took care of them. Whereas in Miami, if you got sick, let's say you lived in a community an hour's drive from the medical center. Um, you got sick, you call your doctor, take an aspirin, call me tomorrow, or something like this. And now the doctor knew who was going, getting AZT or not. That's another thing. They, pre they said it was a blinded trial, but AZT causes changes in the blood count that the doctors needed in everybody, it's a giveaway. Anybody can tell who's on ACT. I can tell you in two seconds who's on ACT. You show me a blind count. And uh, well, the FDA very well knows that uh, if you want to blind a trial and it does do these giveaway things, that you do something about it. I, I personally know this because I once did a trial of a drug called isoprinosine, and isoprinosine causes something, the blood ure, uh, uric acid to go up. It's harmless, but it's a giveaway. So before I got the lab sheets, the, the lab sheets went to a person who happened to be Matilda Krim, who whited out the uric acid, then photocopied it and sent it on to me and the other doctors. So I wouldn't, I'd be blinded. I wouldn't know who was, I wouldn't bias, I wouldn't, you know, be influenced by knowing. Um, and I know this because I was audited by the FDA, the, not me. The, the, the trial, I was audited, I was a participant, the FDA, Inspector came to my office with his photocopying machine on wheels. It's amazing. They came dragging his photocopy machine. He went through all the files, you know, blah, 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 and spent two or three or four days doing his inspection. At the end, I get my report. And one of the reports, and it was all right, you know, but you never get away scot free. There's always a few things that you, you know, you get cited for. And, um, um, but I did all right. Uh, but one of the things was that he saw a piece of paper with a uric acid that hadn't been whited out, which of course wasn't my fault, but you know, he noted this. So they knew very well about this, but they didn't demand that these values were whited out in the AZT trial. So saying AZT is in incompatible with life, for example, when I worked in the lab, nucleoside analogues, of which AZT is, were considered to be too dangerous for technicians to handle because we worked with them, with, you know, radioactive ones to label up cells and things like this. And uh, I, would, I would always do it myself. I'd go to a room that was locked and dispense the amount. We wouldn't allow the technicians to do it because we thought they were too dangerous. So my generation would think that AZ, AZT, God, and it's, it's really not something you want to be you know, casual about. And if you do give it, you can't give it for the rest of a person's life. And as it turns out, the dose was much too high, so they've given a smaller dose. And even to this day, it's, it's a very chancy thing to deal with nucleoside analogues um, that are, what you hope for is a, and one doesn't know what the long-term effects of any of these things are because you're messing with the very essence of life, you know, and um, when you start fooling with DNA. And um, we'd done this before with herpes, but only for a, a week or two weeks, you know, not, not for lifelong. So in principle, these drugs, when I say they're incompatible with life, um, you know, like many things, it's taken out of context, you know. Um, in principle, yes, it is incompatible with life, but in, 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 
a smaller dose for a period, you, you know, you have to weigh up things. And so I have prescribed AZT, but I never gave more than 300 milligrams. I figured that if 600 milligrams were safer than 1,200 and did the worked, that 300 milligrams would be better than 600 milligrams. Of course, somebody might ask, what about 0 milligrams um, or 0 milligrams? But um, um, uh, I do believe there has been a trial of 300 milligrams somewhere and it was equivalent, and, uh, but I suppose Burroughs welcome at the time, you know, if you prescribe 600 milligrams, that's half the sales. If you prescribe 3 milligrams, 300 milligrams, that's a quarter of the sales, so maybe there was a limit beyond which they weren't willing to go. I don't know, these forces, how they work, you know, it's all, you know, they sit in their offices and they calculate the bottom line, that's what it's all about, and you, the idea is, I do believe that they're cynical enough to introduce drugs that they know will have toxic effects and will carry a certain mortality and they know that the, the, the life of the drug before this mortality becomes too obvious to ignore is say two or three years and they work out what the sales are going to be in those two or three years and then they know they're going to have to reduce the dose or something like this and they work out you know it's I'm sh they, I, they must be very precise the auditing and the financials I think they know exactly what they're doing and um, um, I think that's what happens. Do you think AIDS drugs are the answer for Africa's AIDS epidemic? Uh, no. Can you elaborate on that really quickly? Uh, most, most individuals uh, who are HIV infected, um, if you just take the aggregate figure, probably do not need to take these drugs and the drugs probably would harm them um, and there would be uh, an issue of resistance. Um, um, the numbers of people who need, there are certainly people who need drugs, people with more advanced disease who will die without these drugs. Um, and so um, uh, if you think that in general that drugs that really are essentially effective in people with more advanced disease um, are the answer to this disease in the West, you know, which it's not. I mean, the answer to the disease is to st actually stop it. Um, so. Um, um, uh, that's n number one. It doesn't address the, the acquisition of AIDS in Africa. It doesn't address the, the majority of people who are earlier who don't need the drugs. And, it doesn't, and how can we stop them from progressing to AIDS? And we know the drugs are not the answer because there's too much of a downside. Um, that's number one part. Our second part is that um, the administration of antiretroviral drugs requires an adequate infrastructure. Uh, we can try and make it easy by simplifying regimens and things of the sort, but nonetheless the dangers of doing it badly is that you will get resistance, you will get uh, virus resistant from the misuse of the drugs, uh, also toxicity if you can't monitor the patient. Now, and it doesn't mean to say that the infrastructure shouldn't be created and, and it doesn't exist. There are places in South Africa, for example, Uganda, places where these things do exist and I think under those circumstances people should get the drugs. Will that solve the AIDS problem? No, of course it won't solve the AIDS problem. It, you know, it will help the people who need the drugs and they should get it. Absolutely they should get it. Um, uh, but a, a, a big approach, an uh, important approach to AIDS in Africa is what I might call the public health approach. We know that there are intersections between endemic tropical infections, nutritional aspects, and the um, uh, spread of HIV, the ease with which it's transmitted and the speed with which it progresses is influenced by things like worms even, um, malaria, tuberculosis, infantile diarrhea, um, um, in endemic tropical diseases that are, not all of them, some don't do it and some actually are supposed to ameliorate AIDS, but by and large concurrent infections as well as nutritional issues where they exist are, um, are contributory factors to the spread of AIDS by mechanisms that are well understood by orthodox scientists, they're well understood. So part of dealing with the AIDS issue in South Africa is dealing with the public health issue by ridding malaria eradication, dealing with tuberculosis, by providing sanitation so sewage doesn't contaminate the water, by providing clean water, um, uh, by deworming people, uh, which are going to help people anyway. I mean, we should be doing these things anyway. Um, so that, that part is not being addressed at all. Uh, there's that. There's also behavioral issues, stigmatization issues that need to be 
dealt with. Um, um, so it's, those are not drugs, those are just simple things to try to prevent people, condom distributions, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole educational, cultural issues that have to be, it's got to be a multi-pronged kind of thing. And on top of that, we also need to have a better handle on the extent of the problem in AIDS, of AIDS and AIDS, which we don't have. We just have UN AIDS estimates which keep changing from day to day. I mean, they just come out of a computer in Geneva. And um, so we don't know, and we don't know how best to allocate funds and, and, and uh, how much we go to anti, and there is a place for antiretrovirals, but how do we, you know, what we have to say is we need this for public health, we need education, we need destigmatization thing, empowerment of women, I mean a whole bunch of things and how do we distribute our money um, um, into all these activities. There's no point in just pursuing one without everything else.